Um, maybe we, I thought we could frame the conversation by oh. <laughs> just, just talking a little bit about how the film came about and how it took shape. And Verena, in the introduction, mm -hmm. you said that the film was, that the ambition of the film was to um, rethink our interiority and reclaim our fragility. And I'm wondering if that was something you thought about at the start of the project, or if it was something that you that came to you as you were making the film. Um, I really did say that. You did say that, yeah. <laughs> I wrote it down. So it was half of the sentence, I guess, because I could have added. Um, to reclaim our fragility and our vital force or something mm. like that. No, obviously it was not uh, something that was at the beginning of the project because we never know what we're doing. This is the way we work. We don't know what we're doing. So, um, no, I think we, I think this is something that, um, I think this is something that is maybe in every single of our film, it's just we're trying to think about, um, a lot of people have, have said that our film is um, our, um, uh, not human-centric, but I think this is really human centric. But the difference is that we're try maybe trying to um, think of our position in the world uh, in a world that is not made for us and controlled by us. Uh, but like we're trying to think of our body in relationship with non-human, and um, and the hospital is a. It's a wonderful place to think about uh, us as, a, uh, you know, like in between, like in a liminal space between life and death, and and you see a lot of, um, yeah, fragility, and also you see the resilience. Um, but there, there is never an idea of, uh, oh, it's going to be a film about this or a film about that. I think the idea at the beginning was like, um, I think we were fascinated by the people who were giving their body to science. Mm. Lucien? That was that, no? <laughs> Remember the beginning of the film? It was just, uh, we were like chatting about um, what do we do when we give the, our body to science and then we learn so much. We started to read about that and then we started to think about that and then we started to film and then we suddenly enter the world of care. And, uh, and it's a whole universe. And uh, it's a fascinating universe. Um, perverse. Um, more than perverse, um, completely vertiginous, completely uh, um, almost impossible to understand. But um, but that was not this idea of like, oh yes, we we're going to make a film about this or that. Uh, it's just I think we discovered that um, it was endlessly, endlessly. Um, a sort, uh, I mean, our body was just uh, endlessly fascinating. The landscape we can discover, and I don't know. I feel like I'm saying n'importe quoi. What were the first images you filmed? I mean, there are many different types of images in the film, so I'm just wondering what was the first footage that you, you know, were you shooting? Were you shooting or were you, were you looking at medical footage? I'm just curious, what was the starting point? Interestingly, and then you will have to speak, uh, but interestingly, the first, uh, I think uh, Lucien was not even in France when I started all by myself to go to one hospital. And then the first, first, first surgery that I uh, 
a film was a um, pneumothorax. It's like a, somebody whose lung is collapsing. And um, there's two way of, uh, sorry. There's two way of uh, dealing with that. It's either you uh, cut open and then you see inside or you're uh, doing it by, by a celluloscopy. So you're putting a camera inside. And um, and then I, the first surgery, this is the first surgery I saw. And then I understood that it will be endlessly fascinated to be able to pick inside. Um, and then we went, uh, we didn't have any, um, we didn't have any like a program, like, oh, we're gonna go from, because there's so many possibility. You can go from birth to death. You can go from the basement to the 15th floor. You can go to from head to toes or from toes to head, brain. I mean, you can cross and you can think like, okay, that this is the vital, so it's gonna be the, the heart and then it's gonna be the lungs for the breathing and it's gonna be the, you, you, there's many, many way of structuring all that, but there is no way. Uh, how did we do that? <laughs> there is a microphone. <laughs> So, okay. So you were you saying the first thing you shot was was a surgery. Yes. And you were in the room, or were you? Yeah, I remember. I remember. I was. I was like literally. Yeah, I was in the room. I was like, like literally looking. And I remember the surgeon like pushing me and saying, no, you can be so close. Because this is fascinating, just like, imagine having a lamp and then just being able to go inside and look inside. This is, I mean, this is not nothing, it's just our body. This is, <laughs> we live because of that. I, I'm just, I guess I'm gonna ask you about how you structured the film because so I was saying that I think there are many different types of footage in the film. There's the medical footage, um, there's footage that you shot, um, there's footage from hospital cameras, um, and I think the footage works in different ways. There's, there's, um, there are many moments of the film where we don't know what we're looking at, um, and there are moments where we are ver very aware of what we're looking at. And I think that, um, that shift is actually a big part of the experience of the film. So I, I'm curious about how you thought about combining these different perspectives, um, because I think the film finds its, its form from that juxtaposition. Et le chien, putain, just go. Cool. Sorry, I'm, I, I, I just, that's the hardest question you could ask. <coughs> <Not any. coughs> Recognized memory is pretty fallible and it's like non existent. Um, but also, Vechana has a trillion ideas a second and I never have any ideas. Um, but also, to the extent that we were engaged in thinking while we were editing, I think most of our thinking was unconscious. It's the first film that we, am I wrong? It's the first film, I think, in which we arrived at a point where we wanted to give up, where we had like whatever the filmmaker's equivalent to writer's block is, that we couldn't make a film. And eventually we got it 350, 400 hours or something down to 10 hours and two minutes. And we quite liked those 10 hours and two minutes, but we, we were happy that we had broken through our editorial equivalent of writer's block, but we didn't know where to go from there. It's the first time we ever sought outside counsel. Like we showed it to our producers in Paris and they were like, this is so not a film of 10 hours. Um, uh, but we did play with the idea, a stupid idea for a number, uh, on, for a number of months and possibly even a number of times separated of uh, 
we played with the idea of making a series, we played the idea of making a 10 hour film, we played the idea of making four, two four hour films, but we did play with the idea of making a film about the body as refracted through the prism of surgery and making another film about psychogeriatric psycho or whatever that was called in this country because we had a cut of the psychogeriatric sequences that was something like an hour and a half long you know, from the weeks that we spent there, which we utterly adored. And it started, so the, I think there were just three sequences left in the film of Seco Geriat 3, and they're all from the same shot. And that shot is, I, don't, I forget how long it is, but we cut it down to maybe 50 minutes. And that 50 minutes is, is remarkable, and it really holds, and it's really much more powerful as a single shot. And then, I guess there was another more or less hour after that that wasn't quite as powerful, but that was still very interesting to us. But we thought that was a remarkable film in and of itself. But then that reduced the body to different kinds of surgical procedures, basically. Um, all of which evoked things beyond the body. They evoked other human and non-human um, interventions. Um, they evoked our being, they evoked our souls, they evoked both, as Vechena said, both our fragility and our resilience in different ways. But it was there was something not callous, but there was not even reductive. But um, in any case, we weren't entirely happy with the concentration exclusively on surgeries, and we perhaps filmed, I have no idea, 30, 40 surgeries over five years, maybe more. But in this final cut that you saw, there were only five surgeries, five and a half, if you discount gastro. Um, I had to count in Toronto the other day. Somebody asked me that question. Um, and um, I, don't, I don't think, even though we do talk, one of us talks a lot more than the other, um, we, we, don't, we talk about everything and nothing at the same time. It wasn't that explicit. I mean, I don't think we're able to access the decisions that undergirded our editing decisions in the, in the end. Um, the film actually started off in Boston, not in Paris, but it went nowhere because even the surgeons who use different forms of video or different forms of medical scoping um, imagery during their operations and professors of medicine who would use that in their teaching are no longer allowed to keep that footage lest there be a lawsuit in five years or ten years against the hospital. So it was almost impossible to have access to the hospitals in Boston even though we had official access. Sorry, I've talked too long. No. So, okay, so you said you started in Boston, but you were able to get access to several hospitals in Paris. And... Um, Vechena had a, has a friend called uh, Francois Comier, yeah. who we met through a number of degrees of separation, who was then head of the hospitals and the 43 welfare or public hospitals in Paris, and in four or five different group, groups. And he was the head of the north of Paris hospitals. And he is a cinephile, curiously enough, and he co-runs a kind of like medical anthropology cine club in Paris. And he collaborated with this French filmmaker, Chris Marquet, on a number of films, including the Balkan trilogy, and he also f features in them. As a, he was a cast player, he was a UN peace, uh, peacekeeper, or whatever the word would be, in, during the dissolution of Yugoslavia. And he, I suppose, has seen some of the films that we had collaborated on and gave us carte blanche, subject obviously to the consent of everybody that we would approach or that would approach us. Um, and that was, so then we just jettisoned Boston altogether. It was just like the fact that, the fact that somebody would give you carte blanche to an entire medical ecosystem was just like inconceivable. And not terrifying per se, but sort of infinite, it was infinite in its scope, mm -hmm. but it, was, it wasn't even that there came a responsibility with it or anything, but it was just like the opportunity was so remarkable we thought we should move in that direction. Um, can you actually maybe speak a bit to this question of consent um, and, you know, this, this, this central question of, of, of documentary, of this relationship between the, the filmmaker and the filmed the subject. Um, you, what kind of relationships did you have with the people whose surgeries you were filming? What kind of conversations did you have with them? So surprisingly, um, 
we also we we, we also thought that uh, the 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 hospital was like a secret space, like really hard to access. Uh, so so there's two things: the the the, the doctors themselves were extremely happy to have us. First of all, because it's exotic to have uh, like two people like us uh, coming and you know have a different way of looking at them, and um, I think they were happy because I mean everybody applauded the, the you know applaud the applaud 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 uh, you see what I mean Th them during the pandemic. You were doing that I here in this country? Yeah, yeah. Just uploading them? Okay, so everybody uh, was uploading like very loudly and, but uh, that's another question to look at what they're doing every day. And um, because this is what they're doing every day. And, uh, and so, so that was an opportunity for people not to upload, but just to look at what they're doing um, and what they have to deal with every day because it's just really hard to transgress. Uh, every day they have to cut open bodies and, and go inside and, and try to repair us, to fix us. Uh, and um, so they were extremely welcoming to us. Uh, and they were also super interested in the, in the, um, the way we would look at them and, and so that was like a r super easy to, to, to have permission from the doctor. To have permission from the patient is different. And we thought it would be difficult and actually it was not because most of the patient uh, were com completely understood what we were going after, even though we were not sure what we were going after ourselves. But I think with the way we explained was just like we were trying to understand something about what it is to to be there, to be um, fragile, to be vulnerable, to be to be there, to be uh, under the power and and the skills that, you know like completely submitted to the skills of the doctor. Um, all this dynamic is super interesting because what do we know when we're sick? Mm -hmm. We're completely at the mercy of their skill, um, but we also know more than them in a way. So there is a like mutual knowledge. I mean, there is something going on there that is so incredible. And I think most of the patient understood that we were there to try to understand something. And, um, and I think there is also something when you have an anesthesia, anesthesia, mm -hmm you're losing consciousness and having us being there and being the witness, being the guardian in, mm. in a sense, was very reassuring to them. We are like some of the patient in our film, the guy, you know, who has the, the brain surgery, like he called us like three times because he had to have like three different surgery in order for this surgery to work and he would be the one calling and say, oh, I'm going to have another surgery there. Can you be there? Because we would be the one um, present when his consciousness mm -hmm. is gone under anesthesia. Uh, we would, yeah, we would be the guardian, the, the, the company that, you know, it's just like, and, and other people understood. I mean, like there is this, uh, uh, one of my favorite surgery that is not here was um, I'm fascinated about like um, les greffes transplant, transplant. and uh, transplant is politically super interesting um, because uh, you know it's just teaching you that you can live with somebody else member uh, or organ uh, with, with uh, the organ of somebody is that completely different from you. You can be a man and have a, a, the heart of a woman, or you can be a child and having the liver of an adult uh, that is not the same uh, race as you like to say in this country. Um, 
you know, it's just like, it's, it's completely fascinating because there's no, suddenly we're reduced to just being human and not like being a race or being a gender, but like being completely just something different where we need each other to live and you can live with a leg of somebody else, a, a heart, um, a liver, um, a spleen, and uh, politically super interesting because suddenly nothing exists except just uh, pieces of uh, flesh. Um, and it reduces to something else. But did you shoot a transplant or no? Oh yes, okay. for hours and hours and hours. Uh, we have like 400 hours of this thing that you saw. Uh, uh, you just saw two hours. <laughs> so, uh, how did you cut it down? I mean, like, what were the sort Oops. of principles of selection that you applied to like shape the film? If you had 400 hours of footage and a 10 hour cut, how did we get here? Phew. So in fact, so what he tried to answer that, and I said we didn't, we don't know. It was, it really was unconscious. <coughs> Obviously, we were worried about operations, or interactions, or events, or phenomena that seemed repetitive, in which there was a degree of redundancy, and that redundancy wasn't generative in some way. I do think we, am I wrong in remembering that we passed the threshold? It's possibly when, so we we were blocked at a certain point we were at sort of loggerheads with each other and with the film, and we weren't quite sure what to do. We, it was also a very grueling film to make, and we were sort of dispirited, actually, both because it was interrupted by COVID, but then we also filmed during COVID, and then we were in different places and everything. Um, but there was a cut, I forget how long, surely you remember, where there was a lot more verbal testimony, there was a lot more dialogue, and the procedures, medical procedures, I don't know how many there were at that point, were legible to a lay audience by virtue of the, the, the synchronous conversations that we, kept, that we recorded between the doctors and the paramedics. And so at a certain point in each operation, you could have understood what the, like, the, the purpose, the teleology of each operation was. And that, oddly enough, was completely killing. That completely anesthetized the whole thing. Because then the body, basically, to go back to what you were saying, was reduced to a medical body that was there to be repaired, as you said. And rather than activ activating the imagination, that completely foreclosed the imagination. And the body itself receded in, in significance to some kind of instrumental being that was being, that various operations were being performed upon. And I think once we got jettisoned, it took a while, from memory, I don't know how long, to get rid of, to really, w to, winnow out to, to really reduce the kind of verbal testimony. I mean, hopefully at the end it's kind of semi-clear, not that clarity should be valorized, but it's semi-clear, more or less, at the end of each procedure of what's happening. I don't know, that would, we could do a poll. Um, but, uh, but at the beginning it isn't, so that we, one, one is not there thinking, oh, this operation is to, to rectify X problem or to try something, but there would be an engagement with, I mean, the body is such a, you would see this better than I ever could, but the body is such a perverse object. We think it's the most normal, natural thing that we don't question, but it's like, it's such a peculiar, singular object. It's like it's the only thing that we know from the inside. Our own body is the only thing we know from the inside as well as from the outside. It's the object or the thing, there is no word for it in any language that I speak, subject, object, whatever, being, it's the thing with which we have the most intimate relationship, and yet also from which we're the most alienated. We have to shut up? Okay, we have to get yeah. out. We have to take some questions. Uh, let's take some audience questions. Um, I think we have, do we have microphones? Yeah, yeah okay. Uh, we'll start in the front here, yeah. I don't know if I know how to answer that question. I don't, uh, the way we film, I don't think there's nothing intentional in what we're doing. Seriously. 
Is this intentional, what we're doing? Well, we didn't really film it. I mean, half of it was just filmed by robots and doctors and stuff. <laughs> um, That's all right. We just downloaded it. But we're so technically witless, it was much more demanding to download other people's footage. Well, I was talking mm. about what we are filming. Yeah, I know, but occasionally we did film, <coughs> like in Psycho Geriat 3. And it's like, can intentions be unconscious, perhaps? But then are we in a position in which we can exp explicate them? I'm not sure that we are. But it wasn't like there was a single or even any kind of cluster of intentions that we could summarize in words when we were filming outside the body. There were different kind of senses that we had. But it's just, I don't think it's that radical to film in Psycho Geriat 3 to go around the bodies. Like, we all walk around each other's bodies and go, we look down at our friends and up at our friends and around our friends. We don't have to, like, put them in a studio, put your hand up and, like, pretend you're some journalist, like, pointing a talking head camera at Vechena. I think I have an answer. I think it's the camera. No, I didn't listen to you. <laughs> because I thought I had an answer. I think it's the camera. Patrick made Patrick Yeah, Patrick. Where is Patrick? He left. <laughs> no, he didn't have a, he's over there. It's, it's the, it, because we try to make a, a No, no, I think this is I think this is the answer. I think we try to make a the, to film outside the body the same the same way you know so basically the <coughs> the idea of a you know, the celioscopic imagery, we don't really, we, we have seen them, uh, but we try to reproduce the way we were filming inside, outside. Well, you put that correctly in English, yeah. by yourself. <laughs> it was already in correct English. No, it was not in correct. It, so it was okay? Yeah. Oh. And, uh, but Patrick, over there made us like a like a camera that is like exactly basically tiny like tinier than that called a lipstick camera that is neither inside nor outside yeah it's a threshold of interior of the micro yeah and i think it has to do with because the idea was to f you know that there was like this completely um, like th like seeming less things between the inside and and the outside and that we would would be in and out of the body, or like multiple body, if you think about it. It's just like like a human body inside the body of uh, the hospital that is included in the body of, uh, you know, like a bigger body of like society. It's just like a body inside a body and like everything is an organ of another things. And this is why there is all this circulation and there is just because of what it is about. It's like things circulate from one place to another. If you spend time in hospital, you will understand that everything is just going from one place to the other. It's just like this circulation, like an organ. Okay, we'll take another. Was it an answer? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah over there, yeah. I think it was the camera. Yeah, it's part of the answer. So we recorded, uh, <coughs> so the, the cameras that are there for instrumental medical purposes do not have microphones. So there's various, various forms of experimentation, experimentation going on, but basically the medical world relies much more on visual imagery than it does on acoustic imagery. Like you can swallow a little pill and it has a camera in it and then you can excrete it and then all the data can be recovered. Um, but there's no, like, uh, there's no like approved medical use of internal um, sound recording. So um, none of the medical cameras were accompanied by sound. So the sound that you hear is the sound from outside the body that we were recording, as we were also f f recording video and audio complemented by hydrophones, which are microphones that one puts in water or in liquids um, that we put in people's orifices. 
with um, that were sterilized and also with contact microphones that normally have to be a, on quite a hard surface so it doesn't generate the same kind of um, same kind of sonic quality when you put it on flesh for example so uh, not all of that to be honest is completely synchronous we tried to synchronize it when we could but we were not very good technically with time code and so on so it's possible that sometimes when you're inside the body it's not utterly synchronous um, so it's a combination of like no, there's no literally, there's no, there's no acoustic point of view that we recorded that mirrors the optical point of view, but it's a combination of sound that was recorded outside the body on a number of microphones, um, and we're even worse with sound recording than we are with with camp with video recording, uh, technically, and with hydrophones and what are these things called contact microphones. <laughs> 